perfect. Uh, you know, thank you very much. So, so I will give you an update as to what we're doing at uh, Evox. You know, sir. You know, therapeutics. Um, so just to start with, what are we working on? We're working on something called exosomes and, and we're using them as a therapeutic platform. Um, and so exosomes themselves are small nano-sized vesicles ranging anywhere from 30 to a couple hundred kind of nanometers in size. They're found in all biological fluids. All cells secrete them. And this really represents the way cells naturally communicate to each other, deliver things like proteins and nucleic acids safely and effectively from cell to cell. They're conserved in all kind of organisms. Um, and what we're doing at Evox is we've found ways to engineer this natural delivery system to contain drugs. So we can literally engineer these exosomes to contain hundreds of thousands of copies of drugs. And by virtue of being in an exosome, we can now get those drugs to places that they normally can't get to. And I'll show you some of that data. Um, just from an eBox corporate perspective, we're based in Oxford. We're about you know 32 people at the moment, uh, and our goal is really to develop exosomes as a therapeutic uh, pipeline, and we, we aim to develop our own products, put them into man, do all of the clinical testing, and ultimately self-commercialize them. Uh, and we're really focused ourselves on the rare disease space, uh, because we think there's a lot of unmet need there. There's also a very clear link towards target validation. And in a lot of those cases, the issue is not the target, it's not the drug, it's how you get the drug to the right place. And we think we can do that. It also means that we can advance those programs extremely quickly. We think from the time in, in the rare disease space, at least, we start a program to the time we can get to INDs about 18 months. Um, and uh, so we're doing all of that ourselves, but we've also, as you can imagine, this is a broad opportunity. We've also done partnerships with large pharma, and so we will continue to look at that from a large pharma per perspective, particularly in those non-rare diseases where this technology could also work well. And from a financing perspective, we just recently closed a $46 million Series B uh, at the start of September. Um, so again, this is talking to you a bit about the strategic focus, again, mentioning the rare disease space, why we want to do that from a commercialization perspective. And there, in the immediate term, we're really focusing on trying to deliver two types of drugs, e either proteins or mRNA that encode for proteins. And so these are mostly diseases where those proteins are either defective or not there. So from a validation perspective, very straightforward to do that. All Obviously, platform-wise, as you'll see, there's an enormous amount of things you can do with this platform. So we continue to look, look and work at the platform, uh, both for ourselves to see where else we may want to go with this, but also as we think about potential future partnerships. Uh, and, and so we're, we're doing a lot of work in that space. And so if you look at the platform as a whole, there are really three buckets this falls in. One is the engineering toolbox. How do we engineer these drugs you know, to get into exosomes? And this is something we've been doing for six, seven, eight years, well ahead of when the rest of the field got started. Uh, and so we have a very vast toolbox to do that. We've also worked on the manufacturing, so we have a very scale scalable process we're already producing within our labs at scale to support phase one, phase two trials. Uh, so we've done a lot of work there. And thirdly, we have a lot of the leading intellectual property estate. And that's really a consequence of our founders being the first ones back in 2009, 2010, having working on exosomes as a therapeutic platform. Exosomes themselves have been known about for a while and have been looked at from the diagnostic perspective, but they were really the first ones to say this could be a really good way to develop therapeutics. And as a consequence, as you'll see, we have very broad intellectual property 
that not only gives us freedom to operate, but also is going to be a very significant FTO issue for other people using engineered exosomes. So in terms of the loading, um, you know, this is shown on this slide. There are really two ways we can load drugs into exosomes. One way is to lit really take a drug off the shelf and we can load those into exosomes that we've basically purified and so we can do that for things like antibodies we can do that for things like small molecules so let's really take someone's drug put it into the exosome and thereby allow it to get to places where it kind of normally doesn't get to the other way we can do it is we can actually engineer the cell itself to make the drug at the same time that makes the ex exosome so all cells make exosomes, but we can engineer the drug in a way that it's packaged at very high levels in the exosome that that cell produces. And we've done this with a range of drugs from proteins to antibodies to mRNA. And, and, and in both of these cases, we can literally get hundreds of thousands of copies of drug for every single ex exosome with almost all of the exosomes con containing drug. And this just gives you a sense in the green bars is what we've been able to do from a loading perspective. Uh, the blue bars really gives you a sense as to where the rest of the field is at. And, and a lot of this is a consequence of the fact that we've been doing this for seven, eight years. Most people in the engi engineered exosome field have just gotten started in the last 12 to 18 months and are basically doing what we did six, seven years ago. And we've obviously advanced significantly from those first efforts. Um, the other thing that people often ask about is how can you produce them? Is it difficult to produce? How do you quantitate them? How do you analyze them? And we've really worked that out uh, in, it, in, in a relatively straightforward way. Again, all cells make these, so if you can grow cells to produce an antibody, you can in theory grow cells to produce exosomes. We've worked out very simple ways to purify them, basically concentrating culture supernatant that are rich in exosomes and then run them through one or two columns to purify them. And ultimately you get a drug that's in a vial that you can give via all sorts of routes. We typically do most of our work IV sub Q, but you can also think about topical administration, local administration, and there's even some data to suggest or there might be oral administration um, as a possibility. In terms of the intellectual property, uh, you know, we've got a large portfolio now of over 20 patent families. Broadly speaking, they cover engineering of an X exosome to contain any protein and you know any modified nucleic acid or engineering an exosome to express any tar tar targeting ligand. So if you want to try to target them to particular tissues, those are all broadly covered by our intellectual property estate and a lot of those patents are issued or in the process of being issued. So again, puts us in a very good kind of position uh, ourselves um, and, and and beyond those three, we also have a lot of IP on the whole CMC man manufacturing process. So what are the sorts of things you, you can do? And most, almost all of these we've been able to show in, in vivo, so in, in basically animals. We can deliver things like proteins and antibodies into the CNS. Uh, two, you can use an exosome if you think of it as a multivalent platform. Literally, you can express hundreds of things. You can easily and rapidly make multivalent and multi-specific drugs without, en without any sophisticated engineering. We can also, and have shown this, being able to deliver things like antibodies into the cell cytoplasm in a functional way. So if you think of the antibody space, you know, that's limited to a third of the targets that are expressed on cell surfaces or secreted. This opens up the other two thirds of those targets to that whole platform. Likewise, on the nucleic acid front, um, you know, most nucleic acid companies, and I was at Moderna and Al, Al Nylum when they started and helped build out both the SIR and the, and the MR and the technologies, they're really limited in their ability to where they can deliver in vivo. 
mostly to the liver. We can now expand that, and we've shown that we can do that with multiple different tissues. And so, again, these are all cases on the protein side and the nucleic acid side where designing the drug is no longer difficult. That takes a few weeks. The real issue for both of these is how you get them to the right place, and that's what we're able to do, in essence, by using the way nature's evolved to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. And the last piece is also relatively unique. If you think of the exosome as a way to deliver drugs, you can actually combine different drug modalities into a single drug product, and we've done that in multiple cases. So if you're thinking therapeutically, you can, it allows you complete freedom to pair whatever you think the best drug modalities are to treat a particular disease. Um, this is just one example of the, tar of the tar targeting piece. On the left, it's just doing some in vitro targeting of exosomes to tumor cells. And you can see when we decorate those exosomes on their surface with anti-tumor antibodies, they're able to take up exosomes far more efficiently, nearly 100-fold more efficiently than non-targeted. -tar non and on the right is an example where we've been able to improve the in vivo uptake of a small molecule. Uh, into, the C, into the CNS, and so we're able to literally get already three or four percent of injected dose across into the CNS. Um, Pipeline-wise, that's shown here. As I mentioned, we're focused on the rare diseases. Our lead program is a Neiman Pick uh, Type C program. We'll talk a little bit about that. I'll show you some data on that. We're aiming to get that I I IND or CTA filed in the first half of 2020. And behind that, there's a Gaucher's disease program and a third uh, undisclosed program, which we'll be talking about publicly in a few weeks. Uh, both of those are also potential late 2020 I and D's. And so those are the first three programs. Obviously, as we de-risk and get validation on all of these, you can literally think about other lysosomal storage diseases, other metabolic diseases, where it's a cut and paste from one enzyme or, or gene to the next. And that literally takes us three to four weeks to make a drug, and basically three or four months before we're ready to do the in vivo testing. And so as these move on, we're going to have the potential to rapidly expand this pipeline. In, in addition to that, we've also got two partnerships with pharma companies, one with BI who want to deliver an RNA drug uh, somewhere, and the other with a large U.S. pharma that's undisclosed who want to use exosomes to deliver a small molecule into the CNS. It's a molecule that normally doesn't get across into the CNS very effectively. On the Neiman Pick program, so again, this is one of these rare lysosomal storage diseases. Patients here uh, have a loss of function mutation in the MPC uh, uh, protein. This is a transmembrane protein, quite large, 165 kD in size, 14 transmembrane domains. Uh, what's interesting about this disease, because it's a transmembrane defect, you can't treat it with enzyme replacement therapy because the protein needs to be in the membrane. We're able to do that, and we're able to, to then get, using the exosomes, get this protein into the appropriate cell types. If you take a look here, this is shown in vitro. Uh, we've got uh, cells, uh, the, the exosomes are labeled in green, and you can see these exosomes being taken up by patient-derived cells. On the right is actually showing the correction of the deficit in these cells. So the NPC patients, because they don't have a cholesterol transporter, cholesterol increases inside the cells. That increase is shown there. You can see we can bring that back down to near normal levels uh, and uh, you know extremely effective in vitro in vivo we've also done work to show that it also works in vivo when we give these NPC containing exosomes systemically we're able to have significant reduction in the glycosphingolipid le levels in brains and the animals themselves uh, you know appear to be in much better shape and uh, so again this is a program we're, we're rapidly advancing. Uh, and just to 
to summarize, that would be a potential first IIND, the first half of 2020. The other two programs behind it, probably nine to 12, nine months behind. Uh, and obviously, as those get de-risked, we can think about other programs. And on the platform side, we continue to explore the multiple applications of this across different uses and ultimately de-risking that both in vivo, which we've done for most of these, but also doing that in higher species and ultimately then deciding uh, how we want to move those forward ourselves or with partners. And so with that, I'll stop and happy to take questions. Thank you very much.